Welcome to section 27 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video we'll be discussing salmonella, which you can see right here. When we say salmonella, we're primarily referring to salmonella enterica, and there are thousands of salmonella serotypes, so in this video we'll refer to all of these as simply salmonella. In the next video we'll discuss salmonella typhi, which is the only other type of salmonella species you need to be familiar with. This scene will take place on the river as a fun outdoor fishing trip. To represent salmonella, we've shown several salmon fish swimming in the river. So salmon for salmonella. Salmonella is gram negative. So to represent this, we've made the background red, similar to our other gram negative videos. Salmonella is also flagellated. So notice that we've also shown a flag in this boat to represent this idea. Flag, flagellated. This is a gram stain of salmonella. Notice that it appears red or pink under the microscope and is rod shaped. Also notice that it's a flagellated organism. You can see the flagella, for example, right here. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image. Notice that now we've added our first character to the scene. He's trying to catch a fish with a net that completely surrounds the fish, just like a capsule completely surrounds a bacterium. So the net in this part of the image is here to help you remember that salmonella is encapsulated. Next, notice that we've shown a fish bleeding in the water. He must have been caught earlier and then let loose, and now we can see a trail of blood behind him. Poor fish. Anyway, the trail of blood is here to help you remember that salmonella spreads hematogenously. Now we can see little pink bubbles rising from the water in this active stream. Notice that they're pink and resemble neutrophils. This is to help you remember that polymorphonuclear neutrophils are seen in disseminated salmonella disease. As you can see, this guy brought along a lunch, but unfortunately forgot to bring a cooler, so it's getting all gross and moldy. Now there's a nasty black cloud rising from his food. This black color is the color of TSI agar when hydrogen sulfide is produced. So black cloud for hydrogen sulfide production on TSI agar. This is an image of TSI agar. TSI agar stands for triple sugar iron agar, and it's a type of medium that consists of several sugars, ferrous sulfate, and a pH indicator called phenol red. The test can be helpful in differentiating enteric organisms based on their ability to ferment carbohydrates and reduce sulfur. As you can see, the tube right here contains a black color, which indicates that the organism has reduced sulfur and has therefore produced hydrogen sulfide. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image. In addition to the black smoke, notice that his lunch consists of meat and eggs. This is to help you remember that eggs and meat, such as poultry, are reservoirs for salmonella. Okay, now let's turn our attention towards the back of the image. You may have thought that this fisherman was crazy because it seemed like he was about to go down a steep waterfall. However, notice that an avalanche left a big mountain of rocks towards the back of the image, as well as a bunch of dust. As you can see, this mischievous turtle started climbing up the hill, which is what caused the avalanche. So now rocks and dust are blocking off the waterfall. So I guess this fisherman is relatively safe for now. Anyway, we've shown the turtle here to help you remember that, in addition to eggs and poultry, pets such as turtles are also common reservoirs for salmonella. We've also shown a raspberry patch at the bottom of the hill that's getting smothered in dirt by the avalanche. Raspberry patch sounds like Pyre's patch. So we've shown the patch here to help you remember that salmonella invades the gastrointestinal tract through M cells, which are found in Pyre's patches. This is an image of Pyre's patches seen from a cross section of the ileum. The lumen is right here, and the highlighted red circle right here is a Pyre's patch. Notice that the histology is similar to a lymph node, which hopefully makes sense because Pyre's patches play an important role in the immune response. Anyway, like I just mentioned, there are specialized cells called M cells, which are present in the Pyre's patches, and these perform many functions, but a key function is the selective endocytosis of antigens present in the gut. So Salmonella exploits this function by going from the lumen into the intestinal tissue by gaining access through M cells. So like this. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image. So again, raspberry patches for Pyre's patches. As you can see, now we've added a little pavilion covering for any bystanders. Just like in our last video, this pavilion thing represents that salmonella is facultative intracellular. The pavilion is outdoors, but provides some covering. So it's like being inside yet outside at the same time, just like this organism can exist inside or outside of the host cell. So pavilion outside for facultative intracellular. Someone underneath the pavilion appears to be preparing fish, as you can probably tell by all of the lemon juice landing on top of the fish. Lemons are an acidic fruit and are here to help you remember that salmonella is acid labile. This just means that salmonella is inactivated by gastric acid, 
so there must be a large inoculum in order for the pathogens to get past the stomach and invade the gastrointestinal tract. Here are the two guys that have been preparing the salmon. As you can see, the guy towards the back is writing a book. He's probably writing in his journal about how awesome this salmon fishing trip has been so far. Anyway, writing sounds like writer, so it's our symbol for writer syndrome. This is also known as reactive arthritis, and it's a condition that arises after an infection. There are several types of pathogens that can cause this, which we'll discuss in each pertinent video, but for now, just know that salmonella can cause it. The pathophysiology is complex and occurs as a result of genetic gut microbiome, immune, and other interactions that ultimately results in three classic symptoms, arthritis, conjunctivitis, and urethritis. So guy writing for writer syndrome. Okay, now let's turn our attention to the right side of the image where we can see this guy vomiting. I guess he's a bit seasick, but probably has something else much more serious going on considering that his vomit is red. Anyway, this guy vomiting should help you remember that salmonella causes vomiting. Wow, <laughs> that amount of vomit is getting pretty out of control. I guess his crew got pretty worried they were going to sink, so they started using buckets to empty all of the vomit into the water. The red water is used in this image as a symbol for bloody diarrhea and is here to help you remember that salmonella causes bloody diarrhea. I guess you could say this crew of three is secreting the vomit into the water. The number three and the idea of secretion should help you remember that salmonella utilizes a type three secretion system. This is a needle-like protein expressed on the pathogen that allows it to inject toxins into the host cell. So salmonella utilizes a type three secretion system. To make matters worse, we've shown this crew's motor having problems, as you can probably tell by the big cloud of black smoke. We've shown this to help you remember that one of the virulence factors of salmonella is an endotoxin. So toxic smoke cloud for endotoxin. Okay, now you can see that we've added a guy in this third boat who appears to be rowing with a sickle. Also notice that he apparently already caught a fish, as you can tell by the fish with the prominent scales sitting on the back of his boat. Just like in our other videos, we've included the sickle to represent sickle cell disease. The fact that the sickle is next to this fish with a bunch of scales should help you remember that salmonella causes osteomyelitis in patients with sickle cell disease. Unlike his competitor, who used a net, this man successfully caught the fish using his trusty trident. Hopefully by now you know that this trident represents ceftriaxone. So patients with sickle cell osteomyelitis should be treated with the antibiotic ceftriaxone. Okay, now notice that we've shown a do not pass sign up by the cliff. Obviously, these guys don't seem to care too much because it's blocked by an avalanche, but maybe they should be a bit more careful. Anyway, the do not pass sign should help you remember that antibiotics should not be given in a patient with a gastrointestinal-related salmonella infection because it will prolong bacterial shedding in the stool. So to review, you should give ceftriaxone to patients with sickle cell osteomyelitis, but you should not give antibiotics to patients with gastrointestinal-related salmonella infections. Okay, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A 17-year-old female presents to the emergency department with a four-hour history of nausea, vomiting, and diffuse abdominal pain. She also states that she has had several loose bowel movements and one appeared slightly red. Physical examination is significant for diffuse abdominal pain and a fever of 38.7 degrees Celsius. A stool sample is obtained and reveals oxidase-negative, non-lactose fermenting organisms that produce a black color when placed in TSI agar. Treating the patient's condition with ciprofloxacin would most likely result in A. Rapid improvement of the patient's condition B. Infertility C. An increased duration of bacterial fecal excretion D. Hepatosplenomegaly or E. Osteomyelitis Okay, hopefully from the question stem you notice that this patient has signs and symptoms consistent with salmonella gastroenteritis. The patient's history, especially the red or bloody stools, is suggestive of a bacterial infection. Additionally, the stool sample, which revealed oxidase-negative, non-lactose-fermenting organisms that produced a black color on TSI agar, is especially helpful because this rules out other competing diagnoses, such as Campylobacter, E. coli, and Shigella. These organisms can also cause bloody diarrhea, but Campylobacter is oxidase-positive, E. coli ferments lactose, and Shigella will not produce a black color when placed in TSI agar. Therefore, we can be confident that the pathogen is salmonella. So the correct answer is C, an increased duration of bacterial fecal excretion. If we return to the image, recall that this do not pass sign right here should help you remember that antibiotics should not be given in a patient with a gastrointestinal related salmonella infection because it will prolong bacterial shedding in the stool. So remember, in general, 
it's not appropriate to give antibiotics to a patient who has salmonella gastroenteritis. This is a self-limited condition, and giving antibiotics can cause more harm than good. A is incorrect. Multiple trials involving patients with salmonella gastroenteritis have shown that antibiotic administration provides no benefit with respect to the duration of the illness. B is also incorrect. You may have been tempted to choose this answer if you thought this was a toxic side effect of ciprofloxacin. However, infertility is not a known side effect of ciprofloxacin. Similarly, D is not a known side effect of ciprofloxacin. Rarely, ciprofloxacin can be hepatotoxic, but it's not known to affect the spleen, so this physical exam finding would be unlikely. Finally, E is also incorrect. Recall that this is a potential complication of salmonella, especially among patients with sickle cell disease. But treating the patient's condition with antibiotics would not influence this outcome. So again, the correct answer is C, an increased duration of bacterial fecal excretion. And with that, we've covered everything you should need to know about salmonella.